g'day and welcome to Steve's How To In Five. Now today we're going to have a look at the Super Tenere, or I guess by the correct numbers, the Yamaha XTZ 1200 Super Tenere. It's a 1200cc parallel twin and uh, I'm filming it here in the Australian Outback where this machine is right at home. And we're going to have a fairly comprehensive look at it today. We'll look at the brakes, the motor. I'll do a speed test, um, 0 to 100 or 60 mile an hour. And we'll put it in some sand. We'll do a little bit of hill climbing and just have a look at some of the features of the bike. The reason for this video, it's 10 years old now. And what do I think of this bike at 10 years of age? How does it compare with what's on the market now? And we'll have a good look at it inside out and back the front. The motor itself, which is a little bit hard to see in there, it's a 1200cc or 1199cc to be exact. That's a little over, I think about 73 cubic inches. It's a parallel twin, so um, two cylinders, liquid cooled, overhead cams of course, four valves per cylinder, and it produces about 110 horsepower in standard form. That's about 81 kilowatts. Um, it has four spark plugs, so two plugs per cylinder, uh, which is always a good thing. If ever you have a plug let you down, um, you've got a backup spark plug in there. And, you know, it really is a potent power plant. Um, you twist the throttle on this, as you'll see shortly in some of the videos, uh, in some of the clips that I've got, and it hauls. The drive is um, shaft drive, and that's one of the things that attracted me to the Super Tenere. Uh, when I picked it up, no chains, no oiling, no lubing. It's a shaft drive. That adds a bit of weight, but it just makes for trouble-free riding. Brakes on the rear, um, single disc. That's 282 millimeters, I think, or 280. No, I think they're 282 millimeter and super strong, way more than you you ever really need. You can see they've got the caliper mounted nice and high, so you've got this clearance here. You're not building rocks and that sort of thing when you get in heavy terrain, which is always good. If we come across to the front brakes, and the front brakes on this are more like on an R1. <laughs> uh, well, no, actually they're not that big, but um, they're 310 mil. It's a unified braking system. So um, basically what that means is when you apply the front brake, you will put a fraction of braking to the rear wheel as well. Uh, I can't say as I actually feel it, um, but I'm sure it's working. Uh, it was one of the selling points when these were new, the unified braking on them. Um, so yeah, really, really good brakes. Actually, while we're down the front here, the front forks on these, they're 43 mil. Um, and they've got adjustable preload, compression and rebound dampening. Um, they're a decent size upside down fork and they need to be. Uh, we're talking about a big bike here. This is a big heavy bike and you want good forks and they work really, really well in corrugations. And uh, when the terrain gets a bit hard, they never let you down. <laughs> While we're at the front, um, the tyres, the front tyres on these, um, well, I want to say the front tyres, the front wheel size, they're a 110 80 19, and I'm just running these new tyres at the moment. I've only just put these on. Um, what are they? Moto Z Tractionator. And I haven't done many miles or kilometres on these yet to give a, a good report on the tyre, and you can see it's still got little pimples on the edge there. So I'm just just starting to feel them out now. The rear tire is a 150-70-17. Um, and they're a fairly big rear tire. But what I will say is um, uh, with rear tires, how do I term this? Try and treat them as like having a fling with a, a hot redhead called Tiffany. It'll be fun while it lasted, but it won't last long. Certainly don't fall in love with your rear tire, 
because um, look, I managed to chew them out real fast, maybe about 3,000 kilometers. And they've gone, there's a lot of horsepower coming down to that rear wheel. And um, yeah, as I say, don't fall in love with your rear tire, but you will get to try a lot of different tires on it. Mind you, that could be something to do with my riding style as well. Up on the pegs through the sand and bring your weight back. Although I'm not going to do a, uh, a lesson on riding in sand. Uh, Dusty Wessels does a really good tutorial on his channel. The headlights are pretty good. Uh, they've got those magnification lenses in the front of them there. And um, yeah, high and low beam, they seem to throw out fairly well. This is a standard option, well standard option, that's not the right thing is it? But um, this is an accessory you could have fitted on these, these little fog lights. Um, ah, yeah, nah, they're more of a cosmetic thing really, they don't really do much. Um, but I tend not to ride too much in the night because of the amount of wildlife here in Australia, depending on where you are. Of course, if you're on the street and that sort of thing, it's fine. But there's a lot of wildlife here and you've got to be very, very careful at night in Australia. As with any bike, um, look, it's important to let it breathe, isn't it? And by that I mean they're so, so muffled up with all the ADR compliance pipes and that on them nowadays. I run the Acropovic, this one's specifically for the Super Tenere, and it really does allow it to breathe. It gives it a, a bit more torque. Um, not that you need much more. These are a really powerful bike. But all you really have to do to this motor is the air filters, um, put a couple of k &Ns on the air filters and a decent exhaust. And when I say decent exhaust, you can buy your cheapo anything, I suppose. But if you get a decent exhaust, this is an Acropovic, um, you can get a Yoshi. Um, there are a few good brand exhausts out there. Ones that just allow it to breathe and it makes all the difference. It also knocks quite a bit of weight out. This pipe is much lighter than the standard Yami pipe. The panniers, now these are standard Yamaha panniers, they're an accessory when you first get the bike or although most bikes of this age now, 10 years down the track, um, have been fitted with them and as far as taking them off, put the key in, turn, pull that out like so, if you come around to this end, you'll see this little lever, click that, that unlocks it, try and hold the camera and it's just basically bang and the box is off, put it back on. It sits back on reverse what I just did I'm doing this with one hand and the reason I, I sort of talk about the simplicity of being able to take the boxes on and off when you're on the road for extended periods of time you want things to be easy um, these boxes clip straight on and off the Givy top box straight on and off the little Givy tank bag just pull that little and I think I showed you earlier didn't I pull that little red lever there and it pops off it's a two minute job to take off, or not even that, it's a 60 second job to take off all of your boxes to go to, well, wherever you're going to be sleeping. You might be in a, a tent, a hotel room, camping, wherever you are, um, and you want to make things easy. But something to remember is, of course, hard boxes are not the ideal thing if you're doing a lot of sand work, because there's no give here um, for the back of your calves if you're putting your feet down in sand so that's something to remember but if you're doing gravel road and long bitumen hauls it's well worthwhile we can come in there and see the rear monoshock and that's adjustable of course preload dampening the whole lot i've got the bike set fairly soft um, the other day i was out and i did over 60 mile or 100 kilometers on really heavily corrugated roads and if you have the bike set up too hard as you are probably aware if you do a bit of adventure riding you will get fatigued. So I set it up soft. Oh, and the pegs are something I wanted to point out on this. These are an in interesting peg. That rubber section, when you're riding along on the bitumen, you've got your foot on here, of course, and it absorbs vibration. But when you get in heavy terrain and mud and you stand on the pegs, that actually compresses down. I can't, oh, I'm pushing it down with my thumb and you're shoes or your boots end up on the spikes of the peg so you get the track uh, the traction on here um, it's a really smart design 
say if you're having to pop, you can pop them out, but say if you're having to pop rubbers in and out. Um, I hope that made sense what I just said, but they're a really good peg. The seat is adjustable in height. Um, there's a little keyhole that you can see where, just down there, that you can pop your key in. Seat pops off and there's a couple of little rises in there. Well, actually, I've got it on the high setting. Uh, I'm only 5'10", but I like my bikes tall. Um, but you can lower that seat by about 50 mil or two inches, and that will bring the seat height down, down further if you're the type of person that prefers to be a little more flat-footed on the ground uh, and I know a lot of guys do run them down that little bit lower. Rear lights are um, LED so they're a nice bright light and I can't, can I get my foot around there? No I can't get my foot around to the brake light but they've got a decent brake light on the back for um, people that might be coming up a bit close behind you. You can see now with the pannier on um, the Acropovic just fits through there. This pannier is shaped to suit the muffler we come across to this side this pannier is square so you've got a little bit more room in that one and one of the things with the these are heavyweight machines um, if you're not into the touring side but you just want a nice gutsy enduro bike to zoom around on with the panniers off you can remove these panniers you can remove these foot pegs you can remove these steel brackets down in here and you can lighten these bikes up dramatically if you're going to be using it more as a commuter side of things. They've got quite a heavy centre stand. I run my centre stand so as I can do tyre repairs on the road. But um, you can lose or shed a lot of pounds off this bike if you want to. Your toolkit, um, battery fuses, everything is in behind here, this cover here. So you've got one, two, three, four. They're quarter turn screws. Uh, actually, they're um, Allen key, aren't they? Socket head caps. And the Allen key for here, you're thinking, well, the toolbox is in there. How do I get the Allen key? The Allen key to undo this cover is under the seat. So you just click the seat, off pops the seat, and there's your Allen key if you need to get into your, your standard toolkit. I carry my own custom toolkit, so um, I have to say I've never actually used the toolkit that's in the bike. In fact, I've never used the toolkit, the custom toolkit that I carry on this bike. I've never needed to, but I have used it on other people's bikes. And you know, you personalize your toolkits um, so as you know exactly what you've got. Oh, one of the other things I've got here, can I get around and show you? is because the kind of 10 year old bike i've got my usb outlet there and also now i've hardwired it so your ignition doesn't have to be on but that's just for your telephone and whatnot i fitted this one myself there's a standard uh, 12 volt like cigarette lighter one over here uh, well it's not really a cigarette lighter is it it's just a 12 volt outlet but pretty well everything nowadays is um usb so uh, but it's also of course a good voltmeter so you can flick that on or leave it on. I mean, it's not really drawing much, but um, you can just check that you are charging when you're riding along. Of course, you've got a warning light up here, but that's a handy thing to have on the bike as well. Other things that you need on any adventure bike are these crash bars and look they've been utilized you can see a couple of scratches on the side of them um, they're a really important thing to have uh, even if the bike just you get in heavy sand and you're trying to stop or you put it down like i am now in the sand and this has slowly been sinking while we're talking um, and it just falls over on its side they save the bike and of course the sump guard um, you need a sump guard you, because of the, the mass of the bike. If you come across, you're doing rock climbing and crawling and you, you're, um, well, let's have a look. This sort of terrain here, I'm out in the Australian Outback filming this because that's where this bike uh, is right at home. And you've got rocks. And if you come off a little shelf or a drop off, um, having a decent sump guard is worth its weight in gold.
And look, it's a little bit of a pain when you do the oil change, you've got to drop it off or get to the oil filter. <laughs> you can see with the oil filter there, because I forget when I fitted them, I guess I could just look at the books, but I tend to write what the kilometers were when I fitted the oil filter. Um, it's something my dear old dad showed me many, many years ago. But yeah, sump guard, crash bars, uh, important things to have on the bike. Because it is a big, heavy bike, and you pull up somewhere for a rest, or you, you just need to pull over, and you're on this soft, you know, type sand and whatnot, um, I think it's a good idea to carry a small, and I carry it inside the tank bag there, a little aluminium plate. So if you're just going to sit it on the side stand, like so, you can just throw your little aluminium plate on the ground, and it stops the side, side stand from sinking into the sand. Um, you can buy extension plates for them, but they get pretty big and um, I prefer to just pull my little plate. It's only about four inches square, but it's enough to give it stability on the soft stuff. I spoke about the seat, the fact that you can put it up and down. Uh, it'll go down about another two inches or something from there. But something I didn't mention, it's a really good, comfortable seat and they've They've shaped it just right. It's nice and broad across the back section here, and you tend to find yourself pushing back onto that, which is nice, gives you a bit of stability. But then when you get a bit more spirited, you can slide up, and the seat narrows off quite well here. Um, and that allows you, when you're standing on the pegs, for your legs to come through because you're moving your body quite a bit, especially in the sand type work. So the seat, I. I Look, I have to say, I've, I've got no complaints about the seat, and I've spent many, many, many hours with this seat. Now, something I didn't mention, um, the radiator is on the side of the bike. So, come back a bit, that's where we are. There's the radiator side mounted in there. There's a little, probably hard to see through there, but there's a little thermo fan, and the air intake is here at the front of the bike. Um, yeah, so you can see through there. And the reason I'm pointing that out is one of my other bikes, and I'm not into canning bikes, so I won't mention it, but it had a front mounted radiator. Um, actually, another one I had, had the oil cooler. And when you're zooming along at high speed, is zooming a word? That'll do. You're belting along at high speed, and especially when you get up north of Australia, you get locusts and um, all sorts of bugs. And they tend to blanket the radiator when it's mounted at the front. With this one, having the air intake on the side like that, the bugs go in, they'll go whack through, hit the end, and they'll actually fall out and come out down here. But the air is still passing through. That's probably a terrible shot, but still passing through. So, um, and I have to say, I, apart from a brush after a trip, I've never had to clean the radiator on this while on the road. horn that it comes with is useless um, as in it's a little beep beep horn and it doesn't do it any justice but I've fitted the, uh, the larger Fiam horn on there um, you really do need a decent horn on the open road with the, the animals and um, we get a lot of eagles on the road here eating roadkill and it's handy to be able to lay on the horn and give them plenty of notice that you're coming Clutch and, of course, brakes uh, are all hydraulic, so it's a beautiful, smooth clutch. Um, it's a six-speed gearbox, which I don't know if I mentioned before or not, and top gear is great. I mean, cruising speed on this bike, um, well, there's certain regulations and things you have to follow, but uh, it's really comfortable around that 140 kilometres an hour. That's 90 mile an hour. It seems to just be in the sweet spot. Um, you can go up a bit quicker than that up north um, if you want to, but then she starts to gobble the juice. So 140 or 90 mile an hour is the sweet spot for this when you're cruising. It's a 23 litre fuel tank. Uh, I've just whipped off the 
top box there just so you can have a look um, up there that's pretty standard fuel cap 23 litres now that gives you a little over 300 kilometres or three oh, about 300 I don't like to go much more than about 350 kilometres on a tank um, that's what's that getting up towards 200 mile uh, on a tank depends on how hard you're riding it I can get better than that I've had 400 k's out of this without the panniers on and that extra weight and drag just riding it as a, a commuter type bike but um, generally you want to fill it up about then it's what is that it's a five gallon tank a little over five gallons 23 liters they say in the specs that these do 40 mile to the gallon um, I reckon it does quite a bit better than that which is a little over six liters um, I constantly seem to run this more around without all the panniers and gear on around the 4.8 to 5 litres per 100 and with all the panniers and, and gear on around that 5.5 litres per 100 kilometres when she's off the centre stand um, you got about 200 a little over 200 mil of ground clearance that's um, 200 is 100 per 4 inches so um, that's a little over 8 inches of ground clearance which sounds like a lot but you need all of that um, when you're in really heavy rocky type terrain and drop-offs and that sort of thing um, because having all of this stuff does come at a price it's 200 and 260 kilos wet weight so that's full of fuel oil etc um, that's 500 260 kilos I think that's getting up around the five 60 actually probably more like 570 pounds so it is a heavy bike um, there's I mean there's no disputing that but it's it was never going to be a light bike to have all of that power and everything this bike's got you've got to have the weight but there are advantages at having that weight and I'll show you that um, in some of the riding conditions and things that we do If you're into performance specs and that sort of thing um, the Tenere in standard form so that's without the exhaust and without uh, putting on a decent set of air filters and whatnot it does the standing quarter mile in just under 12 and a half seconds um, but with with the exhausting just see the Akrapovic in through there um, with the exhaust and the air filters you can get it into the high 11s which is pretty good for I mean what is really an oversized trail bike um, they've just got mega grunt so what is it actually like to ride look it is a very very good ride I know it's a, a big intimidating bike to many uh, but it's far more agile than it looks it's no motocross bike and it's not like my WR um, it was never designed to be it is a big heavy adventure bike made for long distance touring you do dirt roads you do some sand trails um, you can do single bike trails but you're not going to be doing backflips and that sort of thing <laughs> it was never designed for that it's got a long range you need a good screen on them uh, well, you certainly do in this country because of the amount of bugs and whatnot I'm only getting along here fairly steady um, there are a lot of kangaroos along this road and if I need to pull up in a hurry I don't want to be going too hard um, this bike will cruise at enormous speeds it, it does it easily overtaking is effortless we have road trains in Australia now they're like your semi or semi trailers or your lorries but they are three trailers long so they're enormously long and up north in Australia they get along pretty quick um, you know around that sort of 130 140 kilometer an hour mark that's getting up 80 to 90 mile an hour and you can just open the throttle on this and belt straight past them um, the windscreen on this that I have for the bugs and things as we spoke about before something I didn't mention um, those two little levers that you can see in the top of this view you just flick those two levers and you can move the windscreen up or down while you're going along uh, which is 
a handy thing if you, you don't want to stop to do that. It's a lot easier to put it down than it is to pull it up, I might add. Um, but you just flick those levers forward. I've heard stories of um, people saying, oh, I lost my top screen. And if you don't go over the second cam on those as you push them down, they can come loose. This bike has got ABS. Uh, ABS, uh, look, it's, it's probably not your biggest friend um, on the dirt. In fact, it's not a friend at all to me on the dirt. But what I find is I tend to, I was going to put an ABS bypass and I never did it on this bike. Um, I tend to just stab the back brake just to start the momentum of the rear wheel coming out and then power on. You've got that much power, you can just wind it and straight away it'll come on um, and it'll just slide the back just momentarily. Actually, as I come into this section here, I think it just rode steady through there. But as I come out on the left-hand side here, I don't touch the brakes or anything. I just ease on the throttle and then give it a bit of a blip and the, you can see the taco go up there. The back of the bike will come out and it steers itself. You, you really, you're just sliding around the corner. The mode switch, touring mode, um, if you have it in touring, and that can be a good idea, um, it softens the throttle. It, it leans it up and gives you a better fuel economy too, I think, but it softens the response on the throttle. I tend to run it in sports mode because it makes it, it far more crisp on the acceleration. Um, the, the 1200 tears up basically anything you throw at it, but you do have to keep your momentum up in sand and mud. Um, this is a 270 degree crank. I won't go into exactly what that is. I mean, it sounds really good and it's got ample torque. And I tend to maybe rev it a little higher than I should, but I do like that feeling of, of sliding the bike. Um, that exhaust pipe, um, I don't think I mentioned, it's an Acropovic, it's also the street Acropovic. So it's not overly noisy, um, it's, it keeps you legal. And you want to keep the bike legal, you're, you're touring all over the country, the last thing you want to be doing is getting caught up in, you know, with police and issues and that sort of thing. So what I guess we'll do now is give it that naught to 100 kilometres an hour or uh, naught to 60 mile an hour, uh, just to show that it can break the three seconds to get up to those speeds. And look, it'll continue right up over 200 kilometres an hour or well over 125 mile an hour, allegedly. So I'm told, um, based on what I've read. But um, hey, if you're enjoying the videos, uh, if you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe and you can have a look at uh, some of the other reviews that I've done or got coming up. But for now, um, let's have a run and see how she goes naught to 60 mile an hour. See what it's um, see what it's like. Just got to keep the front wheel on the ground. So although with dirt on the tyre, I'll probably just get wheel spin. We'll see how long it takes to go from naught to 100. That's uh, naught to 60 mile an hour. Here we go. Three, two, one. see that um, that gets there really fast and I mean let's uh, let's be realistic this is an oversized trail bike we call them adventure bikes but really they're a big trail bike so we'll try that one more time I'll try and keep the front wheel down this time slip the clutch just a little bit more three two one Not even out of second gear. <laughs> which, um, which is pretty good, isn't it? I messed around with windscreens for a long time to get the right screen for this bike, and I ended up with this Givy Airflow. Um, I think it's uh, where is it down here? Givy Italian made thing. And uh, look, it's a really good screen. It's one of those dual screens, so your airflow comes in here, comes up and around through the top, and it just throws that air over the top of your head so you don't get that head buffeting at high speed. Um, that's a, a good screen, but I did play with screens for a long time to get that screen. The instrument panel, can I get the camera down in there? I'll just alter that angle a bit. Uh, look, I guess it's... Um, 
it's looking pretty dated now by standards, but it's a fairly simple instrument panel. Um, you've got trip one, trip two, and of course your overall kilometers. This one 51,641, the clock. Um, traction control, you can alter your traction control. You can have traction control one, traction control two, which is for a little bit more spirited riding. But I find I tend to push this, if you hold this button in, you'll see a little orange light come up there and the traction control is off. That is a far better way for me to ride the bike. Um, taco, well, just the old analog type taco, but that's simple enough to read. Kilometers an hour, that's in a nice big digital readout. Then there's another button down here, which is this one here that says mode. And that mode you've got at the moment, you can see mode is in S. If I flick that, T for touring, back, and S. Um, so that's for a little bit more spirited riding. I guess you put it in the sport. Um, yeah, the touring more, I think, I don't know if it leans it up or something to give you a, a little more fuel economy. Um, this one here, if I push over here, up there, what's it say? Liters per hundred. Uh, my average at the moment is 5.3 liters per hundred. Normally with the panniers on and and the bike all loaded up, I'm about that five and a half litres per hundred, which is pretty good. Air temperature, 21. Um, that's about it, really. It, it's, it's not a super advanced screen. Oh, and of course, the fuel gauge, um, which is a good thing. Uh, you get about, when it gets down to that red E, or that little right angle, inverted right angle there, um, that gives you about maybe 50 kilometres, 30-odd mile left in there. I've fitted the hot grips to this one. Um, back up here, I've got the Garmin Zumo. I'm not sure whether the reflection will stop this camera reading that properly or not. When you're riding it on the, uh, the sealed roads, the, the tight and twisty tight roads, um, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's no R1, but it it really handles, I mean, the hills and those sort of things make no difference to this motor at all. You've got that much power under your belt. But it, it handles really, really well. Um, you don't realise you're on a bike at this capacity. I sit, to, I have my seat up high. I like bikes to be set very tall and I've got my suspension set soft um, because it's, I think I might have mentioned before, you don't fatigue anywhere near as much with the soft suspension. Um, on continuous undulating roads and that sort of thing. But it rides well as a, a Sunday sports bike to go up through the hills and brakes, well, they're as good as gold. I don't know that there's a lot of brakes of this era um, when this bike came out that are as good as these brakes. And um, yeah, it's just a fun bike to ride through the hills if you just want to buy this sort of thing as a Sunday cruiser. Ample power, ample braking, it'll turn in really really well with that 19 inch front um, it makes it fun to ride in and around the city I mean you can see here you can lane split if you're allowed to do that in your part of the world um, but it makes a great daily ride if you want to ride this bike to go to and fro to work and that sort of thing um, you can lower the seat level down bring it back where you can get flat footed on the ground and use it as a daily commuter. It will handle that type of riding easily. It's not too wide, it's not too heavy. Um, it's very agile to move in and around the traffic. It's easy to park um, and you've got a high stance. So you can see here, you're looking over the top of the vehicle that's in front of you. Um, one of the things that is a little bit of a pain when you're on lower bikes is you can't see past that vehicle. Um, because the Tenere is so tall, it allows you to look over and it makes it quite a handy daily commute bike. You'd take off all the saddlebags and you wouldn't have all of that gear all over it, of course, although you may wish to keep them on. You may keep your wet weather clothes in there, but it'll do that, this type of work easily. On the freeway, of course, well, it does it easily, doesn't it? Remember, this bike's not made for backflips and jumping logs or climbing rock walls and that sort of thing. It was never designed for that. It's an adventure bike. It's made to cover massive distances, and really, it does that with ease. 
set the cruise, sit back and basically enjoy the ride. So that's a bit of an all round look at the Super Tenere, what it's got, uh, what it does. I've got a, oh, I might have shown that already, uh, 0 to 100, it does that in just under three seconds or 0 to 60 mile an hour. Um, these bikes are packed with punch. And remember, this is a 10 year old motorbike. This is a 2010 model. Um, and I think in effect, they were miles ahead of their time. Uh, I had the BMW R 1200, no, Actually, mine was an 1150 before this. Um, that was a good bike, but you know, and as I say, I'm not into canning anything because BMW is a really popular bike, but there are so many good, big adventure bikes on the market now, if that's the sort of thing you're after. I love the big adventure bikes. I mean, I've got the WR250R and that's a great bike, um, but not the sort of thing you go heading off across the country on. Uh, well, I suppose you can. Um, but there are so many advantages to the big bike when you're you're touring and the extra weight the comfort um, the wind wind from trucks and semis and things coming the other way um, the tenere if you're looking for a, a second hand you know you're not into the new 30 40 thousand dollar motorbikes and you're looking for a good second hand adventure bike um, the tenere really does fit the bill and I think if you speak to any Tenere owner, um, they love their bikes. They're just a, a good, super powerful, super responsive, I um, mean, the throttle response on this, I turn the traction control off always um, because I find the traction control a little bit dangerous when you're coming up to a bend, you just want to open the throttle and, you know, to slide the back a little bit around a bend, the traction control will kick in and um, yeah, I yeah I don't like that I like to be able to open the throttle and the back wheel start spinning straight away and when you've got the amount of horsepower that these things have got that happens um, even on the bitumen in the wet um, if I had one small complaint uh, it would have been nice with a, a 21 inch front wheel and not a 19 um, in the same breath when you're on the bitumen and going through the windy twisties um, that 19 is a really good front wheel. It's super responsive on the, the steering on this thing. It's, if you get a chance to go for a ride on one, um, strip down without all the panniers and all the gear all over it. It's like riding a sports bike through the hills, on the bitumen that is. Well, there you go. That's a look at the Yamaha XTZ 1200 Super Tenere. And this bike is now 10 years old, so you might be in the market for a used adventure bike, you're not into the new category. And I think you could do a lot worse than a Super Tenere. This bike has never, and I repeat, never let me down. They're a good, powerful, grunty machine, um, good on fuel. They will haul long distances. They lap it up. But um, yeah, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel. I've got a heap more reviews coming up, one of which is the uh, Arai XD4 helmet. That's now 12 months of ownership, and I'll let you know what I, I think of that helmet. It's not a cheap helmet, but it's a very good helmet. Um, I'll be doing some comparisons between the Can-Am Spider F3S and the Super Tenere. A few braking and acceleration tests, um, just more for the fun of it. But until next time, Break cheers. Around. Is that a wrap? Oh, I'm my toes. <laughs>